330 BC, a young Macedonian king conquers the Persian Empire and leads his invading army into Persepolis, its spectacular capital city. The Macedonian ruler is Alexander the Great, an admirer of the great Persian kings. By sundown, the Greek victory celebration degenerates into a drunken melee. By sunup, Persepolis, the crown jewel of the Persian Empire, with palaces unrivaled anywhere in the world, is burned to the ground. More than 2,500 years later, these immense towers stand as testament to the soaring heights this now forgotten empire once reached. I equate Persia with luxury, with rich tapestries and beautiful rugs and my mother's fat, fuzzy Persian cat named Otis. But I also think of a fantastic Persian king named Cyrus the Great who believed in religious and cultural tolerance and who freed the Jews from Babylon to return to Israel. Hello, I'm Peter Weller and welcome to the Persian Empire. Around 4000 BC, two nomadic tribes were starting to take root in a rich but hot Iranian plateau, the Medes in the north, the Persians in the south. Being as that these tribes were nomadic, they were more interested in survival than conquest. As they became less nomadic, they had to learn how to farm, in particular how to cultivate this fertile Iranian plateau, but to do that they needed a source of water. The early Persians may have very well become dust in the winds of history had they not unlocked a source of water and just as importantly, a means to channel that water to their crops and settlements. And what makes this engineering feat so remarkable is that they found this water not from rivers or lakes or oceans, but from the most unlikely source of all, rocks. Persia emerged out of nothing, a rugged, hostile terrain built with only invention and determination. 3,000 years ago, nomadic early Persians roamed the parched, forbidding Iranian plateau. Finding water meant traveling long distances. It fell to a hybrid engineer, geologist and diviner called Amogani to figure out how to bring it back to his people. Using nothing more than stone chisels, Moganis would build the first cornerstone of the Persian Empire. A breakthrough system of underground irrigation canals called canats. They began by harnessing gravity to exploit the natural topography of their land, which sloped relentlessly down from the Alborz Mountains towards the Persian Gulf. Vertical shafts were first dug down from the surface and the tunnel was excavated horizontally for a short distance. Then another vertical shaft was built, approximately three quarters of a mile up the slope, and the channel continued. It can be sometimes 20, 30, 40 kilometers away, so it's a very skilled operation to the point where the gradient of the, of the water channel uh, meets the aquifer or the, uh, the, the groundwater sloping up at, at the point where the mountains begin. The angle of the slope was crucial. One unit in elevation for every hundred on the horizontal. Not too steep because that would erode the base of the, of the water channel and of course not so flat uh, as to prevent the water from moving to its intended destination. 2,000 years before Rome's legendary aqueducts, the Persians were channeling massive amounts of water over long distances. In hot, dry climates, with minimal loss due to leakage or evaporation. Water means food, but the engineering technology to locate that water and move it was a carrot that the Persians were dangling in front of their neighbors. Around 700 BC, all of these tribes were united under one legendary figure named Achaemenes, who founded a dynasty. But this dynasty thrived and flourished under one guy, a guy I would have liked to have met, named Cyrus the Great. Cyrus created and maintained an empire, thanks no doubt to his military savvy, but he was also a political genius. He was an excellent, benevolent manager of men. Historians have called him humanist. The Jews call him Mashiach or anointed one, his own people called him father, and even the Ionian Greeks whom he conquered called him a just and worthy lawgiver and ruler. Cyrus the Great came to power in 559 BC. It was the beginning of the Achaemenid dynasty. Their reign would change the course of history, 
and redefine architectural possibility. If you're looking at the greatest personages in history who have affected the world, Cyrus the Great is one of the few who deserves that epithet, the one who deserves to be called the Great. The empire over which Cyrus ruled was the largest the ancient world had ever seen and may be to this day the largest empire ever. By 554 BC, Cyrus had crushed all rivals and became the undisputed leader of Persia. Now it was time to conquer the world. And if he was going to build an empire, he would need a magnificent capital city to reflect its growing stature. In 550 BC, Cyrus launched one of the most ambitious engineering projects anywhere in the ancient world. The Persian Empire's first great capital city at Pasargad, located in modern Iran. Cyrus was a very innovative builder, and I might add that his standards were particularly high. We can also say that his building project reflected in some ways the technologies that he found in the course of his various conquests. Like the Romans centuries later, the Persians were borrowers. They took the best and most advanced ideas from the cultures they conquered, then developed them even further into technologies uniquely their own. The art and engineering of Pasargad drew on influences as far-flung as Assyria, Egypt, and Asia Minor, thousands of miles away. There were stone workers, wood workers, brick makers, uh, relief makers, and we know that these were people often imported from all over the empire. Today, over 2,500 years later, Crumbling ruins are the only remnants of what was once here, Persia's first shining capital city. Harsagad's showpiece was its two magnificent palaces, surrounded by a majestic park and vast formal gardens. Among them, the first known appearance of the astonishing Paradisia, the four-quartered walled Persian gardens. The gardens had over 1,000 yards of channels of carved limestone, designed such that water would enter small basins every 16 yards. The Paradisia of Parsagod laid the foundations for many of the world's most magnificent gardens for the next two millennia. What's particularly different with the Paradisia is the application of the geometric design. So we have squares, rectangular designs, floral designs, cypress trees, wild grasses, roses, lilies, all kinds of vegetations. And this is the concept of the modern park as we know it.